This is the Get A Life Podcast, X-Cult Conversations. Hello everyone and welcome to today's episode of Get A Life, X-Cult Conversations. Our guest today is Damien Hasty, who's an investigator from Scotland who has been taking a very, very deep look into the exclusive brethren, Plymouth Brethren Christian Church, um, and in particular their finances. Um, so um, with that, Damien, I'll, I'll let you introduce yourself to the audience and tell us how you got into this particularly interesting and murky area of investigation. Thanks, <laughs> um, Yeah, I've, obviously... A little bit about my background. I I didn't do much investigative work. It was always a, a career thing that I wanted to go into. Um, but up to the start of COVID, it wasn't something I was really into. I'd never heard of the Plymouth Brethren Christian Church at that point. Um, and it all started really back in June, yeah, no, probably June, May, June, twenty twenty. Um. I was still working, but lockdown meant that we were quieter than normal, which gave me a bit of time really to start doing as a hobby. Something to do in the house was looking at the contracts released by the UK government. Um, this is how I stumbled onto the Brethren. Um, it was, there was a couple of contracts that I'd looked at I was working with a couple of other researchers, investigators at the time, and we were looking into contracts just generally to see where they'd gone, who got them, was there any links to government, and were they transparent, especially seeing the contracts were awarded in the UK without competition. Yes. So we started, uh, I started that, and then obviously I was working with a couple of others. Probably towards the end of May, beginning of June, as the contracts came out, and actually the brethren appeared very quickly. Mm. So I remember the <clears throat> the first contract that I found was for uh, Medco Solutions, and just curious looking at the background of the company that had just been set up, didn't exist until the end of uh, March 2020. Uh, no history. So obviously you look at the directors to see their background and that's when I first saw links to the church, basically, to the brethren. Um, and even then, I, I did think it was a little bit odd, but I didn't really read too much into it until the very next day I stumbled across the second one. So those links were that they were directors of the church or of church meeting halls? What was the, what was the clue that gave it's it away? Good. So the original clue was um, on Medco, one of the directors was also a director of a company called Zest Trading UK. Right, yeah. And Zest Trading UK is actually, obviously now I, I fully understand the brethren, is the trading company for, uh, they say it's Campus & Co. Right, so, okay, yeah. Uh, a fundraiser, fund, fundraiser for One School Global. And I noticed that one of the directors had been there. When you looked at the other directors, it very quickly you could see the links to the to the church. So yes. that, that was yeah. the first one. And then the very next day, the second contract that I stumbled across actually linked to the rapid relief team. Yes. Uh, and quick check of the rapid relief team. And it was the brethren. And to be fair, then I went searching, I went back through all the contracts I'd reviewed. And very quickly got up to 13. Yeah. Um, which was uh, highly unusual, I would say, just based on the numbers of brethren and the number of companies they've got. Added to the fact, a lot of people said, well, yeah, but they deal in safety and workwear and PPE, but these companies didn't. No, no. So, no. And then from there, really, um, I, I worked with a guy, Peter Jukes, from Byline Times. Yeah. Uh, and one of their journalists. So the first article that came out was in the Byline Times, and that was 
uh, mid well, towards the end of July 2020. That was the first um, press story on it. And pretty much any PPE story, a COVID contract that's been related to the Brevin ever since, I've yes. had in point. Yeah. That's been in the Sunday Times or the Times and even in Canada, I spoke to uh, Press Progress. Yes, yes, they're good. Yeah. So that's how it all came about. And then I think from there, just from the, trying to understand what the link to government was. Uh, and I think from as, as each day passed and more companies were found, Mm. You, you then began to try and paint a picture of what the brethren were about. Mm. Uh, and and to me, just generally over the time since then, talking to ex-members like you guys, it, it, it very quickly became apparent that this is a commercial, this is a commercial structure. This isn't it doesn't feel like a church at all. It, it feels like a business. Mm. Yeah, the church is just a thin layer of paint on the outside. Yeah. yeah. So what um what kind of personally motivates you in this? Because unlike us, you don't have any back history with the church. Um, I, I kind of reading between the lines of what you publish, you uh, do you regard yourself as a kind of an anti-corruption whistleblower? Is that where you're coming from with this? It, it is. Yeah. I, I think there's probably two or three things. I think the first one is just generally. My what I did. My research is all based around lifting the lid on uh, corruption, um, and I'm not saying that there is. They are corrupt, but obviously I, everything I look at is that's why I'm looking to see. I'm looking to see if there's links to government, is there lack of the conflicts of interests, um, yeah. and whether that be brethren or non-brethren. I still look, I still do a little bit of research that isn't brethren related. And then I think from there, it did grow into more. So for, for the brethren, I, to me, I, just looking at everything, I, I still can't understand how they kept their charitable status. Yes. It, it yeah. stack up. It, it, what picture was painted to politicians is, is to me, feels wrong. Um, yes. And then and just common decency says that actually whether this religion is a right, is a correct religion and above board, actually the way they're treating their ex-members and the way they treat their people inside, it, it, that started to drive me as well. So it wasn't just about it being corrupt, it was about a, a level of fairness and how yes. they treat the people and, and the hypocrisy is off the charts staggering of course yeah. there's an interesting um the other aspect that i find for some reason uh really upsets me is that the members in there are being exploited commercially you know even you know even the ones that genuinely believe in the system they're trapped in this system where every single every dollar they spend every pound they spend the church is trying to capture it and I, I and right down to campus and co i mean if you look at the if you look at the brethren as if you look at the brethren leadership the church should we say as a business and you look at the brethren members as their customer base they are coming within an ace of capturing every every dollar that those people spend um they you know it started off with well, we'll give you phones and fax machines and you can pay exorbitant rates for it. And then they've gone into insurance and medical health care and vehicles. And now it's the supermarket. So, you know, even your toilet roll is taxed. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, that's extraordinary, isn't it? I mean, is there any other organization, religious organization that, that, that captures the revenue stream of its members in that way? I, I've not come across any, and I do look at other religions as part of some of the and, and other sects as I look at uh, my research. Um, what, what strikes me very much with the brethren is that there is, it, it, obviously in the 60s, was it the, the system was, the hails were thrown out for trying to bring the, the system in. 
Yes. Uh, and, and really, all I've added on the front of it is eco, because now it's the <laughs> eco. <system. laughs> exactly the same. Uh, and, and there's a little bit of me understands it. If, if you were trying to distance yourself from the world and be um, just within your community, I kind of get why you would try and set up a, a system that keeps everything within. But the levels of wealth for circa, when I, I've done my research and in, investigations into the UK, you're looking at probably a hundred families, probably extended families, fathers, sons, so maybe 300 families, 400 families in total. I, yes. th I think I have all the wealth. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. I mean, if it was a like a, a semi-communist or extreme socialist system where the wealth was distributed and it was like they were operating co-ops of which they're all shareholders, that would be at least equitable in some sense. But it's not like that. It's the rich preying on the poor. And I mean, it makes me laugh when they talk about ecosystem, because any time you have an ecosystem, guess what's at the top of it? A bunch of a small number of very fat predators. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, my message to brethren in there who have big mortgages and are being constantly pestered to sign up to this or that initiative is, you know, the money is flowing in the wrong direction. I mean, I, I, I genuinely believed, I genuinely hoped um, when I saw the brethren winning those huge contracts and obviously making billions, I hope that at least some, some small proportion of that might be pushed back downstream to the grassroots brethren who actually made it all possible. But there's no evidence that that's happening at all. It's all just staying up at the top. And the kind of the first thing they do after winning these contracts is, is come out and beg for more money from the ranks at rank and file at the bottom well, the one bit i don't understand is is around the global amount needed each year to to run in reality the schools yes. that's that's the cost but yes. more than anything else it, it, it's the education system yet there is enough wealth in that church now to easily run that church where 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 Bruce Hales is looking to raise is it half a million, half a billion dollars. Yes. The cost and the returns of that would yeah. uh, basically run the the whole of the the, the cost of the brethren. Yeah. I can't see why they can't do that now. Yes. Uh, it, it it there is wealth. I, I've done some research recently that looked at pretty much every company I could find in the UK. Yeah. Had Bevan linked, so you're looking at 15, 1500 uh, live companies, probably yes. another 150 that are sat dormant. Yeah. And in there, the, the wealth was it, it, it was just their assets alone were worth over two billion pounds, so <laughs> what 3.4 3. Uh, billion Canadian or. Yeah. yeah, Australian dollars and just yeah. in assets. Yeah, uh, yes. and, and you look at that and think, well, surely you, you, if you've got just that in assets in your businesses, just in the UK, without looking in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, or uh, the US, you must have the money to to actually easily run this each year. But the wealth seems to be all at one end. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, the one... reason that they put forward to needing money for the schools is the whole reason for getting money out of everyone. It's the excuse oh, I came out three years ago, and that's constantly put forward as to why you buy your groceries from the school. And that there's a whole in in UBT. There's a whole division called the the household the the global household division. And that's a team of people. Um, my brother-in-law was the global manager who got given the Land Rover for a, for a business car. Um, <laughs> plus, a, he would have been on a three-figure on a on a six-figure um, salary, and he, he was the, the the global manager for a household division. They come up with ideas like great men videos where they would 
that you where you pay, I think it was four or five hundred New Zealand dollars for a set of videos about the great men. Which, which every household was obligated to buy. There was this canvas of the seven great men, which every household um, was obligated to buy, even if you're on the breadline. Um, and all these things, just to get money out of everyone. And the reason was the school needs the money. So that whole school needs the money thing is just trotted off the whole time. Mm. I, I, one of the things I, I do find strange, is just, and obviously I, a lot of my research has been UK based, but in the UK, the, to run the schools, to run one school global, costs them approximately 40 million a year, 40 million UK. Campus and co in the UK alone raises 5 million of that, mm. just in the supermarkets. Then you look at the Grace Trust, which is the, the main charity in the UK, or was the main charity in the UK, that takes its money from UBT, there's another 15 million straight away there. So Sorry, say, that, say that again, how many million? 15. 15 million, yeah, so that's 20, yeah. Yeah, so you're yeah. at 20 million straight away just from campus and just from UBT. So you, without touching any of the families, other than their businesses. With all the wealth that's floating around, I don't understand why they can't find another 20 million. I think the charitable status alone of the, the halls is worth 30, 30, 30 to 37 million wow. in UK terms. So I, I, I struggle with the numbers when I look at the wealth, the top 80 families in the UK on business, eight, eight the top 80 businesses in the UK all have assets more than four billion. <laughs> wow. Plus it, they pay school fees anyway, so they get a big income just by directly invoicing the parents. Yes. Yeah. The numbers don't stack up. That's and and, and obviously in Australia they, they get grants towards the cost of the schools as well. So substantial, yeah. So, yeah, so when you start looking at it, you think, where's the money going? Where, where, where is it going? If, if you're inside the brethren now and you're watching this and you're not sat in a £4 million house with a swimming pool, then you're not in the elite of the brethren. <laughs> not to mention the vehicles. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, 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 the whole structure of how it works, it, 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 to me, I keep looking at the numbers and thinking, well, where's the money going? Mm. One thing I'm really looking forward to is, you know, you, you've been working incredibly hard on adding up the rich list and all the finances, and you're starting to go uh, more global. Um, now, I realize I know it's harder to actually dig into these things outside of the UK. One thing that is to the, you know, UK government's credit is that it's easy to find the beneficial owners of all these things. So give them one one brownie point for that. <laughs> um, a lot harder in Australia at the moment. But once we've got a, a good, a substantial proportion of that data, we can extrapolate. We know how many brethren there are. Um, mm -hmm. it, they're very, very consistent around the globe. I mean, yeah, the ones in Argentina are not going to be making so much, but mostly they, the vast majority of them live in wealthy Commonwealth democracies uh, plus USA. So we're, or you, I should say, give you the credit, you're going to have a pretty accurate number for how much money they raise globally. Uh, and the other number that's not hard to, uh, to obtain is, is the cost of schooling a child from, you know, infant through to high school. These are all government figures. We, we know how much that costs. And then we're going to actually put the numbers together. And, you know, instead of saying, where's the money going? We're going to say, where is the 2.73 billion or whatever the difference is? Where is that going? Um, is, is that something you anticipate reaching sometime? Uh I do. I, I, one, probably one number I didn't give out is 
oh, I've not mentioned yet, is them top 80 companies in the UK, so this is after tax. So when them companies have all paid their tax, them yeah. 80 companies in the last, if you look at their last financial year, most of that is 2021 that's mm. been logged. Made two hundred and fifty million pounds. So, <laughs> what's that? That's that, that, it, you, you're looking in ends up by one point seven for for Canada and one point eight for Australia. That more than that. That's just profit. Yeah. Just profit. Yeah. Wow. That so just take any wages. So it doesn't take anything else into consideration. That's, that's left over profit yeah. in eighty companies. So just to sum up what you're saying, um, in the UK, the schooling is costing approximately 40 million a year. Half of that is paid by um, Campus and Co plus the Grace Trust. So that leaves you 20 million. Plus then they're charging school fees of around $1,000 a pupil, which must be add up to a few more million. So let's say they've got you know, a, a deficit of about, let's say, generously seven million to make up. Um, those wealthiest brethren uh, companies, after tax, after they've paid all the wage, have got two hundred and fifty million to play with. Um, so they could reduce that to, you know, two hundred and forty-six million, uh, and they would still be able to afford you know, fish and chips at the shop around the corner and um, probably a bicycle to go and collect it, wouldn't they? Uh, it, 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 the, that's why I said the numbers don't stack up. Mm, mm. Uh, yeah. the, the more you look at it, the, where, where, where is the, the real wealth going? Um, mm. And the other pressures, one of the things that I, I, irks me a little bit uh, has not been forever, but coming and looking and investigating is the reason I was talking to somebody who left within the last 12 months mm. and they were saying that as a, a young brethren member 20 year old you're looking to get married you know you're, you're They have to purchase their first house, and it's expected they will spend in UK terms six hundred to seven hundred thousand on that property, mm. which is mm. over a, over a million in Canadian and Australian dollars. Yes, yeah. And that very first property, it's all to me done to keep that coercive control, the control that that person has got a job in the brethren. They've got yeah. a big mortgage. Mm. How do they leave? How, how do they walk away from from that? It, it becomes almost impossible to leave. Yeah, yeah you leave with nothing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that, that really continues right through your life. Even you know, as you get older and your children get older, you get a bigger house, and you know, you even get to my age, you might still have a big mortgage, and and you've got no qualifications, and you're all tied up financially, and you can't mm. leave. Yeah. And it even continues after you're dead, because what we're increasingly finding is that older brethren are being pressurized and coercively controlled for leaving all their money to the church in their will. Mm -hmm. um, it, it's a it's a shocking it's a shocking system. I mean, what you're saying about the houses is also something that you wouldn't have been so aware of is the intense pressure there is inside the brethren for young men to get married. Not, not so much for young sisters, but I mean, when I got to 20, um, you know, in the locality, Cambridge, where I was, there was extreme pressure to get married. It was like publicly said in the meetings, sort of young bachelors who had got up to sort of 25 and weren't married were publicly called out in church for, you know, not getting on with it. And of course, I realized why that is now. I didn't realize at the time. It's because once you're married, you're trapped. I mean, a, a lot of people who leave, they take advantage of that little space in time when you're kind of old enough to be independent, but you're not married to, to get out the system. And they want to minimize that because not because they're concerned about 
your soul, it's because they're losing customers. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's it, everything seems to revolve around money in, in, and a lot of money. Wealth, uh, if, if you average that wealth out across the Brevin worldwide, there should mm. not be a poor person in the Brevin. No. <laughs> Yeah. No. yeah, but the fact is that there are poor people in the Brisbane. Mm -hmm. There are people that, that struggle. And um and there's there's a lot of people that have no idea. Um and actually Bruce Hales put out a a sheet a few years ago for for young brothers um about how to save for a house. And it was laughable really. Um he said they should buy their first house by a certain age. Um they should that it should be four bedrooms and they should do this and should do that. And, uh, and I looked at it with my family, and it was just a joke. Um, there was no way that anyone could do that um, because of the wages that we were getting in New Zealand. Mm. Um, one, one of the things I've heard recently is that wages are inflated at the time they're purchased in the property. So just the, before purchasing, you say? I, I, I've been told by somebody that's left fairly recently that wages are actually inflated by whichever brother owns the business while they purchase the property, which you would I, I, obviously without proof, but it, it, it is hearsay. Um, yeah, well, yeah, wages are put up, like when a young brother actually comes to get married, the wages are put up so he can purchase the property. That's, that's often done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then the 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 other thing that I, I followed, obviously, there's some things that I don't put on the website that I, I do because obviously there is a a real brethren at the top willing to take people to court. So unless mm. it's factual, I I will not put it on paper. I'm not put it on print. Yeah. Um, but one of the things that I have done is. Uh, uh, is look at some of the you can track some of the wealthiest brethren's uh, own personal property moves over the years so I was looking at one family uh, in uh, the Reading area in the UK mm -hmm. and a particular wealthy family and one with, with close ties to the Hales I may add um, he purchased, so this brother would have purchased his first property around the age of 23 mm -hmm. for £1.3 million. <laughs> in yeah. He then moved to another property yeah. for £2.1 million just before his 30th birthday. So what was that number again? 2.1. 2.1, yeah. 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 And then... Uh, since then, since obviously all the COVID contracts, of which mm. he was to, I believe it's bought a property close to four million pounds. That's and quite the, the palace. Person is not yeah. forty years old yet. Yep. <laughs> wow. And even after that, they've still got plenty of change. I mean, they they really do have the problem of having more money than they know what to do with, mm -hmm. um, which, which makes it all the more kind of egregious that they still constantly uh, pestering the grassroots members of the flock for more cash. They, they go around cap in hand like shameless street beggars, you know, with this $4 million mansion in the background. I mean, mm -hmm. that, that's what upsets me because, you know, I know a lot of people in there and I know a lot of people who work incredibly long hours and struggle to make ends meet. And they're subjected to this barrage of raw commercial propaganda, which is all tied in, you know, it's not saying buy this because it's wonderful and it'll be good for you. It's saying buy this because we desperately need the money to help our schools. And it's all a lie. Um, mm -hmm. it, it really is shocking. I mean, you yeah. run out of, you run out of expletives and adjectives. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We <laughs> the, the same thing that used to annoy me, Richard, is is when Bruce Howells came to the country, yeah. and and the, the the brothers who got given the job to organise the the travel arrangements mm. were the were the wealthy brothers at the top, 
yeah. and they didn't give a toss what it cost. Yes, and yet, and all these families would be expected to take the whole family to the mm. to the meetings. Yeah, and they'd be presented with a bill for six hundred dollars per head. Wow, um, <laughs> and they just expected to pay it. And, and then you get yeah. some brother saying, "Well, well, if look, if you just put fifty dollars aside every week, you'd be able to afford to." <laughs> to, to, to go there it was it's simple isn't some it some families <laughs> couldn't put 50 dollars aside every week they couldn't put two dollars aside every week well exactly um, yeah yeah so if you put a hundred thousand aside if you put a hundred thousand aside every week you'll get to a million quite quickly well what's the problem I don't understand <laughs> yeah yeah so that was in the sense that they had arranged airline travel and so on that was way in excess of what you could have got by going the, the cheapest carrier is that the kind of situation yeah, well, 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 it was the rich guys organising it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, it, it's just what you're saying. It's it's yeah. just just mindless. Um, the rich and the poor, and the mm. the, the mindless um, things that go on in there. I mean, when I was in when I was in the Brethren in Canada, you used to have to arrange the travel through Hughes Travel Trust, which was a Brethren company. I must have been superseded now. And yeah, the, the price you'd pay for a ticket was like twice what you'd get if you went to a travel agent. And so people would try and arrange their own travel independently and they get the wrist slapped and say, no, you must book through Hughes Travel. And they'd say, well, it, you know, it's much cheaper just to drive or take a train or get a cheap flight. And the answer was, oh, yes, but we use the surplus to subsidize brethren traveling from Argentina or something. Now, whether that was true or not, I, I kind of suspect it all ended up where all the rest of it ends up. But <laughs> that's the kind of crap that goes on. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, well, and we had a you... young brother recently that alleged when he was getting to the age where he was going to be buying a house, they started coming to him and saying, let us keep a certain percentage of your paycheck and we'll hold oh, it yeah. for you. We'll save it for you. Yeah. yeah. Which takes away his choice of uh, whether to stay or whether to leave. Because they're holding on to you part of your paycheck. Yeah. I mean, sooner or later, if they haven't already, they're going to set up their own bank. Um, I mean, in effect, they've they've kind of got that already, but that's got to be the next thing on the on the agenda. Oh, they've been talking about that. Yeah, they have been talking yeah. about it. Like <laughs> when I was in there, they were talking about their own bank. Mm. Mm. I find it interesting in the UK... Um, Obviously, the Grace Trust, which is was the major charity that everything UBT fell under, One School Global was funded mm. mainly from the Grace Trust, Rapid Relief Teams funded from the Grace Trust. UBT has moved under a company, UBT Holdings, and is no longer uh, directly into the Grace Trust, and it's run mm. by a couple of brothers. Um, but interestingly on there is that they've moved into um, having a private equity sort of bank in the background. Basically, mm. it's funny, Richard, before when you talked on the transparency in the UK, the mm. bank is based in Jersey, which then the transparency disappears. And <laughs> I suspect that some of the UBT money is now disappearing offshore and... and the ability to track it will become more and more difficult. It's very, it's very interesting. I saw that, and 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 I know that John Hales and Bruce Hales had spoken very strongly in their ministry about not using offshore financing arrangements, which they described as unrighteous. So I was very amused to see see Jersey, which for people whose geography is not up to date is a is a semi-independent island somewhere in the English Channel that is notorious for hosting dodgy <laughs> banking institutions. Um, I'm, I'm tempted to think of some pun about pulling the wool over their eyes, but it's just, just coming to me yet. <laughs> <laughs> it's also interesting, the private equity getting involved as well. Yes. It? Because I can, it's clear that they've created the vision fund or the growth fund to um, invest in in some of their own brethren businesses. Mm. Uh, I see quite clearly in the way in the UK how that's structured. So basically what you've got is the vision fund very much like a, basically private equity would mm. be for people that don't understand private equity, 
if, if I'm running a business and I need a cash injection into that business to, to really grow that business, uh, and, it, and, and when I say cash injection, that might be 20 million pounds, 20 million dollars going into that business. Basically, the private equity take a share of that business and they invest the money in there. And quite often with private equity, what they do is they put their own directors in there to oversee, mm -hmm. make sure that the, the business is growing. It, the vision funds are doing very similar. So I can see in the UK that you've got uh, two or three brothers that are, when the vision fund invests in a business, suddenly become directors of that business as well. Mm -hmm. So a couple of examples, Kingsway Global, where you've got uh, Tim Drake coming in as a, as a director of that business. And then also uh, More Oak, again, Tim Drake was appointed to that, um, one of the, the Freeman family. So mm -hmm. you, you can see these people, are, it's almost like we're use, they're using a private equity model. Yes. Um, but what's interesting is that there is still two or three businesses within the UK that have suddenly been allowed to take proper private equity. Yes, with, yes, with non brethren private equity. Uh, yeah. So basically, if you look at them businesses, it doesn't look now like they are on paper brethren own businesses. Mm. So um, an example would be what was the turn as the Southgate business in North, Norfolk. That business, if you go on to the UK's company's house, it's got a whole list of directors. None of them are Brethren Brothers. But that business, once you dig down into the shareholding of that business, there are very convoluted and quite complex uh, structure. When you get to who owns that business, it is still owned by the Turner family and they are still working in that business. Wow. So apart from anything else, that helps them to evade people like you who are just browsing through companies' house to see who owns what, so they can own a business and it doesn't look as if they do. I suppose you, I mean, how hard is it to get down to that layer where you actually find the brethren? Is it all in public data? Yeah, yeah it is. It's not particularly difficult, but it, it's following that chain. So yes. Uh, Usually you're looking for who the major shareholder is. And generally what you will see is you, you've got one company and then that's got a parent company and that's yes. got a parent company and that's got a parent company and that's got a parent company. <laughs> and you follow all the, 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 the chains uh, yeah. linked in the chain. And by the time you get to the end, you come to what was the original company quite often. Yes, yes. Yes, I mean, well, I did some digging into Australian businesses, brethren businesses. I mean, particularly in connection with what's now called Innovos, you try and dig out their, you know, the actual beneficial owners in Australia. And, and when I first started publishing about that particular um, group of people, suddenly a whole load of things disappeared. Um, addresses on websites were changed. Um, names of this and that were changed to conceal the Hales connection. Um, you know, mm -hmm. suddenly their office wasn't in Sydney. It was on Perth, the other side of the country. Uh, and then when you dig into the shareholding, uh, um, they're all owned by family trusts and anonymous mm -hmm. family trusts. But when you track, track back the family trust, you find the family trust was originally named the something and something Hales trust. Yeah. Um, but, you know, they've got this weird legal structure whereby uh, um, a family trust can own or trust can own something and, and there's no publicly available data on who owns the trust, mm -hmm. which I think is changing. Um, there are proposals to change that. But, I mean, it's a haven for fraudulent schemes if, it's, if that's how it works. And, and I yeah. kind of suspect that they get the money out of the UK as fast as they can because it's just too easy to see there. And once it's actually got to Australia, it vanishes like a, a stone dropped in the ocean because it's all mm -hmm. opaque there. Mm -hmm. um, the big question in my mind, and I suspect in yours, is how does they how do they get the money from the UK to Australia? Because I think we have a pretty shrewd idea. That's where a lot of it actually ends up. 
Yeah, the, 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 obviously there's quite a few companies now that, and, and UBT is a great example. U, UBT obviously being a global business, mm. it, you, you do wonder if, and, and there are other businesses that might have different names in Australia and a different name in the UK. Some have got the same name across three or four countries. Mm. But there is a lot more global companies and I, I found it really interesting if you looked at the COVID contracts that were awarded to the Brethren, actually, it, it, it really summed up the Brethren for me it, uh, to what actually happens. Circa 85% of all the COVID contracts had direct links to the hails. Mm. And then mm. the crops went everywhere else. Yeah. Yeah. And 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 then when you obviously initially the big winner was Unispace. Mm. So Un, Unispace was Gareth and Charles Hales's company. Mm. Um, the UK arm of it reported was a subsidiary of the Australian business. So actually everything that uh, was in that business in the UK went back to Australia. Hmm. And working with Private Eye, uh, a couple of the journalists at Private Eye, what we could see was when it transferred over to Santi, hmm. Santi Global, which once the Gareth and Charles had sold the, the uh, Unispace business, they moved everything and the contract over to this Santi Global. What hmm. you could see with Santi Global was what they reported in the UK was really obviously they'd made, I'm trying to remember off the top of my head, it was something like 80 million profit. Mm. Mm. When you went to Australia and some Australian journalists had done some work on Santi Global or it, it reached a threshold where they have to report in Australia, yes. then it was suddenly doubled. Yes. <laughs> I, I actually thinking, well, if all the all the contracts were in the UK, how, how come in Australia that the profit was so different? Yes, yes. Well, I mean, this reminds me of the uh, Starbucks scheme, um, mm -hmm. which is that Starbucks weren't paying any tax in the UK. And the reason is they weren't making any profit. The reason they weren't making any profit is the coffee and sugar they bought from the parent company was sold to them at extremely exaggerated margins so that it just kind of balanced out the profit they made. So technically they were running at a wash in the UK, but it had the effect, practical effect of transferring all the profits offshore into a lower tax regime. And I imagine mm. any any time you've got an international company with branches and subsidiaries in different countries, it's very easy to make the profits appear in the country where you want them to appear. And it would take some pretty good forensic accounting to... Um, and, and I mean, to some extent, it is legal to, you know, for internal trading, it is legal to some degree to manipulate the price, isn't it? Um, yeah, I, I generally believe that, uh, that a lot of uh, what is done is, is legal. I, yes, I, I've yes. come across evidence that says it isn't uh, legal. I, well, I let's not forget this for is... a church if it's moral. Uh, <laughs> oh, there, there does yeah. feel a real. A, <laughs> A, a real, we will use, uh, it's not tax avoidance, but it, it's tax reduction. Yes. Um, a lot of the UK companies have R&D in uh, what's called a patent box. Um, yes. And this, that reduces your, your tax uh, tax bill at the end of the year. Uh, amazing how many Bevan companies have actually got that in place. So yeah. it's like every single... They don't miss a trick, is what it means. No, no, like. no. Yeah, well, let's not forget that this is this is Bruce Howes's. This is how he started off. His mm -hmm. his uh, his career was was tax with with his father. That they, they were saving tax for people, and yeah. um, big, big companies. They were they were looking after their tax, and he he knows all sorts of loopholes, mm -hmm. and um, he'll be doing everything he can to to do this sort of thing. Yeah, it, 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 it's the fact that it's, it, it's very rare you come across a company, I think I came across one actually in the last two or three weeks, where I looked at their accounts and thought, they're missing all the loopholes, they're not, they're not 
they're not using <laughs> this, they're not using that. Yeah. Um, which is is really unusual. Um, uh, and you do question their loyalty then to do well, yeah. <laughs> forever and when, when they're not following all the, 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 the they're too the they're too honest to be a to be um a loyal brother. Um, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, just to go back to what you were saying before, Damien, about um, the brethren being common shareholders with with the outside what we call worldly peoples. Um, that that is a, I'd like to do a bit of a Cheryl rant here. I oh, know I can't, but that, that is a that that's what the brethren call call it a compromise. And you know, going back just a few short years, that was a major a major major thing. That there was absolutely no way that you could you could be a common shareholder with a with an outside person. Diversely yoked and, with and unbelievers. They're trying to hide it. They're obviously trying to trying to hide it in one sense, um, but in, in another sense, they're not trying to hide it as well. And it's it's just excused now. Sorry, go on, Richard. No, diversely yoked with unbelievers was their scripture, wasn't That's it? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And and now it seems that they they're just not ashamed of it. Yeah. And it, it's just it's just absolutely incredible that they would go to that that low if if you like yeah and um in, in 1959 there was a major split in the church with directorships where people had to leave their jobs there's a yeah. there was a big thing in the uk in scotland where a, a lot of people had to give up their directorships of companies mm -hmm. um, and families were split over it and that sort of thing yeah hundreds of hundreds here of they are yeah. doing this today yeah <laughs> Yeah. yeah, it's not that there's anything wrong with it. It's the hypocrisy that they have, you know, wrecked hundreds and hundreds of lives over the past 70 years on this very issue. And then without even a blush, they suddenly turn around it. And as long as you're in the elite, you can go do it. I mean, that applies to a whole string of things, of course. But, um... it, it, it's interesting, Richard, you touched on it before uh, around how things suddenly were moved off websites and names changed, addresses changed. Mm. Uh -huh. That's a common occurrence in the UK. So yes. particularly when I've looked into some uh, uh, Medco Solutions is a great example. Our website changed about four or five times, different addresses. <laughs> off. Each time you could link an address to something and you, you, know, you published it on Twitter, the next minute that address had changed. LinkedIn yes. profiles being deleted and new ones being created and yeah. Uh, where work being removed so uh, which for me as an investigator always makes me yes. think what are they hiding so yes I, it's a giveaway isn't it changing things why yeah. is it why it, 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 one of the things i picked up on that was one of the medical directors was also a director in um a shareholder in a very small part of santi global uh, santi global when Unispace was sold, but he worked mm. for Unispace up mm. until the pandemic. I'm absolutely yeah. convinced that the, that business, Medco Solutions, so Medco Solutions, to give you some background, is the yeah. biggest COVID winner uh, of the Brethren businesses worldwide. So they won just shy of a one billion pounds worth of contracts, so 1.7 billion in Canadian 1.8 in Australian dollars mm. and that that business did not exist prior to the pandemic mm. the directors the two brothers um one worked for Gareth and Charles Hills at something or mm. Unispace as it was at the time but he went into his LinkedIn profile and took that away <laughs> the other interesting thing there is when you, you actually go and look at that is that Medco Solutions PTY Limited in Sydney, Australia mm -hmm. is owned by Dean Hales. <laughs> so so it, you, you look at that and you think, well, he owns Medco Solutions PTY. Mm. He also owns Medco Solutions Inc. in the US. Mm. But he didn't own it in the UK. However, there is a, 
in the Medcore Solutions UK version of their accounts, there is still 48 million waiting to it went to a third party. <laughs> and we're still waiting for this third party to, to release their, uh, their account. And so when you start looking at it, it you just yeah. think you tr they're trying to hide things. Mm. And it, in reality, it felt like all the businesses that won. So the, the big money wasn't actually, other than Unispace with the PPE, the really big money was in the... The COVID tests or the, the rats, the rapid mm. uh, antigen testing, that's where the real big money went. And that mm. went to the hails. Uh, yeah. In New Zealand, just recently discovered that they supplied 30, uh, the New Zealand government bought 120 million rats. 38 million were supplied by a company called CoShield Global. Yes. And CoShield <laughs> is. Coach Shields, one of the New Zealand's very good. It's quite open in the transparency of who owns the companies. So Coach Shield is predominantly owned by UBT. Mm. So it's owned by Caleb Hall, Chief Exec, Global, the UBT. It's owned by UBT. It's owned by Dean Hales. So that's New Zealand. In Australia, two there was two contracts, one, one by a company Westlab one by Tucson. Tucson is another business owned by Dean Hales. The contract in the UK, owned by Medco Solutions, where we don't know where the money's gone yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, the other one was a company, Sterilabs. Sterilabs, actually, when you read the contract, it was a joint, a joint effort with Santa Global. And by the way, West Lab in Australia, it was a joint effort with Santi Global. <laughs> and Santi Global is owned by Gareth and Charles Hales. Yeah. So when you start looking at everything, there's always yeah. a Hales. Yeah. Anything yeah. that is big and financial mm. with the revenue. Yeah. Yeah, it's almost like a kind of a status thing. I mean, I imagine if you were in the Brethren and you actually exceeded the wealth, of one of the Hales companies, you would be in a very, very dangerous place. Uh, they don't like anyone to get ahead of them. You know, they always have to have the biggest chunk of everything that's going. Um, it, it, it's interesting you say that, Richard. When I looked in the UK, it felt like you were not allowed to let your business turn over more than 50 million. Yeah. <laughs> and your, your assets really can't go past 25 million. Right. <laughs> I, but we obviously because of the, the the pandemic, there's a couple of companies that have pushed them uh, them yeah. them levels. Uh, and interestingly, one of them had um, a non-executive director brought in from within the brethren. Oh, I've oh, met them. Uh, I've met yeah. them. I mean, that's what happened to my family business that my father set up. It was going well, and they they. They brought in a non-executive director, um, all done very subtly, but with a push from Dean Hales. The non-executive director introduced a friend of his as a general manager. And at that time, it was, you know, they were just, my father had three sons, but one of them had passed. So it was just myself and my brother. Um, I was the junior and I wasn't into management anyway, but I was perceived as a threat um to this general manager's position because in practice you know i tended to make the decisions in consultation with my older brother who was the manager and so after a, a year or so suddenly there was this massive kind of constructive dismissal exercise which successfully ejected me out of the business um and i kind of thought well i know where this is going in in course of time we're going to find that that non-executive director and the general manager um, actually become full directors of the business. And sure enough, three years after I left, I mean, I only looked this up a couple of weeks ago. Sure enough, looked up the looked up the company, and those two people are now full directors of the business. Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's that's what their non-executive directors are about. Yeah, I, I definitely think there is this the. An element there that a business isn't allowed to grow too big 
and yeah. definitely not bigger than the, the Hales businesses. But I also think yeah. there's some businesses that the ownership is uh, opaque, as you say, in Australia. Um, mm. uh, and some of these businesses may well be owned by the Hales anyway. Um, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of things that have always intrigued me throughout this is how and where the contacts are. How, how did they win all these COVID contracts? Yeah. I think I know. I can't say. Yep. <laughs> I, think I think we all know. Uh, uh, pretty much everybody. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, and it does link. It is an Australian-UK link within mm. there um, yeah. at government level uh, is all I would say. That That's what. And, and uh, I've talked to many, many people in, in People that have worked for Brethren companies, suppliers to Brethren companies, mm. suppliers of PPE to Brethren companies, um, people that have introduced Brethren companies to Chinese companies. So when you start getting all this information together, uh, uh, currently working on probably the biggest piece that we've that I've done linked in with a couple of others to to really get the over the line and I hope to get that out and published in the next couple of weeks Wow! in, in, in something that is pretty amazing really when I look at it how a business has to me managed to cover its tracks of when there's been anything controversial and it feels almost as if somebody's helped them cover the tracks mm. right the way through to how they won a COVID contract a substantial, so I'm talking, mm. uh, I'm, I'm, I'm talking a, I'm looking at the eight figure number <laughs> contract. Uh, and now probably have all the pieces. Uh, and it is a fascinating story that goes back over 10 years and looks at that company. Wow. And, and what, it, it's it's been a strange experience probably the last three weeks because I started on the rich list and I got to part four, mm. and part four is this is the piece, <laughs> and, and, and it, it it just goes on and on and on and goes arms and legs to mm. a, a company that have taken the European Commission to court. Mm. Um, I, I could I'm not going to say anything, but I could no. probably hazard a guess. Um, yeah. we, should you, we should probably make it clear here that all the data you have is securely backed up elsewhere. And so even if they do decide to accidentally run you over with a bus in the next few days, <laughs> we will make sure it all gets out. And so it's all set with the times as well. So I can yeah. say that quite okay. well. The times have the whole story. Yeah, if I was your wife, I'd, I'd be insuring <laughs> you for a high value. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, I, well, I, it's probably the most, it is the most, uh, it, it probably brings everything together. Um, mm. At the moment, it's just trying to get all the, the T's crossed and the I's dotted on mm. every information that we, we, yeah. we've got. That's I think when they see it, their I's are going to be crossed and their T's are going to be dotted. But <laughs> <laughs> There's probably one thing we can be sure of, and they, they would have shared a few restaurant meals with a few people, I, I would think, which is also very much forbidden in the Brisbane, yeah. until recently, that is. Uh, yeah. I, I, it, it, um, it is interesting. I, I, within this, there is somebody within government that I, 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 I can't prove at the moment, but I do wonder if there is a link there. That's all um, I'll say. Do wonder if there's a link there. Um, I think he still is the only politician that has blocked me. Yeah. Well, the, well, the, <laughs> the good without life me doing anything. Is... So I, I do wonder why. Block. Yeah. So who, who, I guess you'd be following the Good Life Project as well. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. yeah they're, they're, they're trying to cover. They're trying to open up from the other end and aren't getting on too well. I mean, yeah. well, I shouldn't say aren't getting on too well, but they're. The, you know, the government's pushing back very, very hard, of course, against yeah. them. Yeah, so the Good Law Project, I've, I've done work with the uh, Good Law Project. Um, obviously, they they went to print with um, the Michelle Donnellan, who's a mm. minister in the UK. 
uh, story. So Michelle Mann um, is now married, and I think they've just had a child, um, to Tom Turner from the Chippenham and Brevin. Yeah. Um, and, and what fascinates me on that story is a secondary bit, is that their contracts show that they won four million in the UK, yet they paid tax on, but their tax would suggest that they turned over that year 30 to 35 million. And that business last year and the year prior turned over about four. So what that would suggest to me is that that business that was linked to that family at the time did probably 30 million in PPE, um, all at the very beginning uh, of the of the uh, pandemic. So how have they managed to pay so little tax? What what do you think the mechanism is there? No, no, the I, I'm, I'm based that. On oh, you go based on the tax, the, right? But their the accounts day. don't show it. Yeah. Um, yes. So in the yeah. UK, if a company turns over under thirty six million, they don't need to put in a full set of accounts. Right. Yeah. Um. I, I wouldn't be all surprised if that company turned over thirty five million nine hundred and ninety nine thousand nine hundred. Right. Okay. <laughs> I see what you're saying. <laughs> Because yeah. I'm amazed that, that, that it, the tax would suggest it's at that level. Mm. Um, so you don't get a clear picture of every company. But yes. where you can usually work out is by the tax that's paid. So corporation tax up mm. until this year in the UK is 19%. So uh, we know how they will use every loophole to avoid paying mm. more tax than they, they, uh, they have to. So if you work on the basis that worst case scenario, that can only be 19%. If mm. somebody has paid a million pounds in tax, their pre-tax profits must have been close on 5 million. Mm. Mm. So, so there, there's work a... Work out the turnover on that. Yeah. Uh, substantial. So for some reason, that company particularly didn't want its full accounts to be public. No. No. <laughs> I, I, I'd be. I still find it very strange that, that I find it hard to believe that didn't turn over more than thirty six million. Mm. That was just uh, what that suggests is that the profit they were making on the PPE would have been circa twenty five percent, which is huge. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I, 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 and the other interesting bit there, linking to what the Good Law Project did with Michelle Donnellan, I do know that within the Cabinet Office in the UK. There was real anger that that story had been published. Interesting. Real anger. Now, Very interesting. Working the journalists route, sometimes, yes, it annoys government when stories come out, but yeah. not to the level I heard that had happened with Michelle Donnellan's story. Oh, that's very interesting. I mean, how long has the UK government got left? When's the next election got to be by? Uh, by the end of next year. Yeah, because, I mean, at that time, inevitably there's going to be a change of government and that's when all the all the cans of worms uh, explode simultaneously doesn't it i mean i, I think some of it come out i think some of it won't um not being cynical i think there's some things that just won't come out i, I have spoken to a number of mps that have been uh, uh, mps that have been uh, non conservative mps that have been mm. mps in brethren areas Mm. where their communities are just really to get a flavour do they get lobbied mm. and they're not conservative mm. uh, nowhere near the level no, no, that's what I'd imagine they're, they're aware of them but not yeah. nowhere near the level that are conservative mm. Mm. Yeah. it makes me laugh hearing about these houses heavily into the PPEs and COVID stuff because in, in uh in 2020, I, I was I, I wasn't kicked out until August 2020. But we were told in, in the brethren that Br Bruce Howells has said for for the brethren not to rush into um, doing any anything to do with COVID. You know, don't rush into supplying PPE and anything related to COVID because it's it, it wouldn't be wise. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I mean, we know why that was. Yeah. That was so as to 
reserve all the really juicy stuff for his, you know, his favorites. Um, you know, they didn't want competition from grassroots brethren down there. They they wanted to scoop it for themselves. Yeah, yeah, he obviously could yeah. see that see it was a good thing and uh wanted the grassroots brethren to stay away from it. Yeah. I mean, I must admit, it's been my policy for a long time that if there's something that Bruce Hales tells you not to do, obviously there's something good there that you ought to get into. So. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I have heard of a company in New Zealand that did totally ignore what Bruce Hales said and, and <laughs> ended up uh, um, doing a couple of things they maybe shouldn't have done. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, Damien, it, it does sound like that we're going to have to get you back in a few weeks' time because it sounds like you're on the edge of something. I mean, if you're still around in a few weeks' time. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that sounds so morbid, Richard. <laughs> no, believe me, I, I have reasons for, for what I say. Um, uh -huh. Actually, in that connection, the um, two of the people, I mean, when the when, you know, I don't know if everyone knows the story, but the Brethren hired a very dodgy private investigator to hunt me down and and allegedly to kidnap me um certainly they asked him to steal my computer um two of the guys who hired him are rod diplock and brad mitchell now we're talking about co-shield global um uh, when this private investigator approached me and said look you need to get out of wherever i was ontario because someone's you know they're after you um, he gave away the names of his clients, um, Rod Diplock, Brad Mitchell. So, so I go online, put those names in, and one of the first things that comes up is they're directors of CoShield Global. Um, so I, I put the conversation I'd had with the private investigator online, and, and lo and behold, suddenly CoShield Global's uh, page for you know, our management was offline. It was just an HTTP 404, whatever you get on the screen. But of course, and this is what I'd advise anyone to do, I'd already got it on Wayback Machine. So we have now preserved the whole leadership of CoShield Global that they don't want you to know about. It, interestingly enough, I also turned up much more recently a video on the UBT accountants website, which was promoting their ability to do these complex transactions whereby you get non-brethren um what do you call them invest what was the term again damien the the uh, investment yeah private private, private investment private yeah private, private equity. equity that's right there, there, there were there's this video promoting how that the ubta could manage this complex stunt to get non-brethren private equity in your business and still retain ownership and one of the testimonials was was brad mitchell and, you know, maybe they just put him on because he's got a pretty face, but I, I doubt it. Um, anyway, I published this on on um, the ex brethren Facebook page, and suddenly that testimonial disappears off UBTA's website. Um, but I had fortunately downloaded it. Uh, I republished it on YouTube, and shortly afterwards I got a complaint. UBT accountants was hitting me with a copyright strike for putting Brad <laughs> Mitchell up on YouTube. So I think I've I've now got it on MSM or something, some other channel. So no doubt they'll be receiving lawyers' letters soon. But you know, they could the internet's a big place and they can chase me around as long as they like. I don't mind. <laughs> it, 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 when you talk about I, I, obviously the story in Australia was it the I think it was it the the daily the daily something that in, in Australia released a couple of stories yeah. recently. Um, yeah. And when we I, I worked with the guy James, he was called when we did the the second version. Yeah, to, I, I spoke to him. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, to bring in the the Wessel uh, Wessel up there. Yeah. What was interesting there is Web Westlab and Santi Global had exactly the same article on their web pages. Exactly the same article. <laughs> yeah, Except yeah. where it said Santi, it said Westlab and vice versa. Yeah. But you, you're talking here a case study of probably 700 words, and the only differences were where it said Westlab, uh, Westlab yeah. it said Santi Global and vice versa. Mm -hmm. As soon as they published the story, 
both them case studies disappeared. <laughs> both, both <websites. laughs> <laughs> they probably they should they should do a PhD course in slamming the door after the horse has fled, shouldn't they? I mean, it's um... uh, it, 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 to be to be fair, there is uh, some of the sometimes I'm I'm doing investigation. You're looking into a company, and you're you're researching lots of different areas. You're doing Google searches. You're going into dark web. You're going into doing all kinds of things that you're looking at. Yeah. And then the last thing you go to the website, and it just tells you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, they're kind and of clueless. It, it yeah. still amazes me that actually that should always be the first port of call to mm. look at their websites. I can't yeah. believe how much information they give out. It, it's it, it feels like it's it's a brag. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. And I, I was going to say that they to them their whole. I mean, we were saying this on the previous podcast that to the brethren, your value is simply your net worth. I mean, I found a little meme that said, what would you be worth if all your money was gone? Uh, and, and to them, that that's the beginning and end of it. And they just can't resist. If they've achieved something financially, they have to brag about it. And then they later find that, oh, you know, there was something dodgy. They, they knew there was something dodgy, but they then when a journalist picks up on it, they suddenly panic and try and wipe it out. Mm -hmm. But they can't resist the temptation to brag about it. Yeah. Um, yeah. See that throughout, throughout for their own so. detriment. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Damien, it has been a great fun having you on. Uh, it's been absolutely fascinating, and I feel that this is just the you know the first nibble at the cake. Um, and you know we really look forward to the next the next chapters and so on. I, I just wish we had more time, but. Um, mm -hmm. Is there anything else you want to um, want to add on this episode? Uh, your famous last words, as they say. <laughs> I, 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 I think for me, um, thank you for inviting me on. Um, yeah. it, it really will be fascinating if this story is all and we can get it all printed because it, mm. it it's a series of events, um, and I think it really does sort of expose how the bedroom workers businesses um mm. uh, it links into ubt it links into the hails it links into china it links into mm. core uh, contracts it links into taking people to court uh taking companies to court uh and budgeting for things that they uh, I, I don't think i've ever seen in somebody's accounts before a a, an accrual of an amount of money to that they know they're going to have to pay out in court. Mm. Why not pay if they know they're going to have to pay? And it hasn't gone to court at that point. And I don't think it ever did mm. go to court. So mm. it's been accruing for, uh, for me, not playing fairly. Mm. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I, I think if we can get that whole story out, as I say, working with a number of journalists, the Times do have everything, uh, yeah. but they're not the only ones with everything. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, if I was to disappear, there is definitely somebody to pick up on that. Uh, <laughs> and I think I'd be the final bit of the story then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, no, I, I have nothing else other than I, 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 it's been a real pleasure the, the three years just Obviously, I've, I've spoke to so many people that have been in the bedroom, like yourselves, and the one common factor that I see is everybody knows that every everybody suffered the loss of somebody in their family and some people more than others where they no longer see that, that family. Yet every single person I meet or I've talked to that's ex brethren is a genuinely decent human being who really cares and, and actually when you asked earlier what spurs me on that partly is what keeps me going um, wow. Thank you. Reverend, that's, that's it, it, it's, it's the ex-reverend community yeah yeah, yeah. No, we, we really appreciate that i mean yeah. uh, we don't have many people on who are not ex-members and it's and it's really it's really potent actually to get a, a so to speak an outsider's view 
of what the brethren really is, because the brethren's standard rebuttal is, oh, well, they're just disaffected former members with an axe to grind. And mm -hmm. sure, we do have an axe. Uh, I think possibly Carmen has a chainsaw or two. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> When it comes from someone who's never been part of the community, who stumbled across this by accident, and you get their, you know, unvarnished, researched view of what it's about, that's that's very it's very valuable to us in the ex brethren community to have that. So, um, thank you very much. Thank you for promoting our podcast on the on your website as well. Appreciate that a lot. Yeah. And we're really looking forward to the next episode. Yes, very yeah, looking forward to it. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Damien. There's a lot of grateful ex brethren Yeah. Yeah, for all that you do. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. To share your story or be a guest on the show, email info.getalife at proton.me.